There'll be other opportunities in the market in other areas, but I'm just saying in this specific area and you found yourself on this specific video, go 100%. So much of an advantage that people born 20 years from now that look back at coding are going to be like, what the heck? I wasn't given that opportunity in this window we're in now to build out a software application that makes you millions and you can kind of proceed in that manner. Enough of the little side projects, enough of the little games. If you actually want to learn how to develop a full stack application using Cursor AI, watch this video. To be clear, if you're just using Cursor AI to build out little fun games, build out a little landing page and you know just use it for the experience, this is not the video for you. I'm gonna give you my experience and my practical insight from building out a full-blown artificial intelligence software that's backed by Google of what it actually takes to build out a full stack application. Therefore, this video is for you. If you wanna build out software that's scalable, you understand the implications, and you know everything about it. Because what I can tell you right now is software isn't just code. There's a lot more about it. Let's jump in. If you're just finding me, you've probably seen a ton of stuff when it comes to Cursor AI in your feed from a bunch of people, like a bunch of people, a bunch of people. But typically in the context of how they're showcasing Cursor AI, they never show the actual real insight when it comes to building out real software. Up to this point in this timeline of where we've seen in history, this is the first time that being able to build out real software using something like Cursor AI is actually pretty applicable to someone that is new to coding. Therefore, there's gonna be a lot of people in this space that tell you this, that, and that, but have no experience. So let me give you some real experience here for what you need to understand if you wanna take this journey. Because trust me, it's not as easy as launch Cursor AI, make 20,000 in two months, use my micro SaaS. Oh wait, no, don't worry, buy this book and it will show you, no, no, no. Let me show you actually what's going on here. Let's break it down. As a side note, if you wanna see a bunch of Cursor AI videos and how to code with it and actually how to use it in the context of software, check out this channel. All right, first major thing, and this is gonna be the obvious one. This is the one everyone knows when it comes to software. Obviously, you need to code it. With coding, you obviously need a backend and a front end. This is just like the yin and yang of software development here. So the front end could be React based and the back end could be Google Cloud. Front, back. Now what I just said there is very loaded. It's a very loaded statement. And what I mean by loaded as in like, it's just not that simple. <laughs> here is a couple of questions you have to ask yourself before you entertain the idea of coding. And this is just the first part of this entire video. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag this little line here. And I'm just gonna do like the first letters. The first major question you have to ask yourself is what language am I using? L. Am I using Python in the back end? Am I using J6 in the front end? What am I using? There is a ton of different languages and there's tons of different reasons why you would choose a different language. Now, as a side note, use Python if you're doing an artificial intelligence software. Just trust me, everything's more native there. Everything's better there. Then the question comes down to what kind of backend do I want to use? Well, that really depends on your context. What kind of application are you developing? B, the next thing you need to understand when it comes to software development is that there is good code and bad code. Software development, there's a lot of situations where it's two plus two equals four. There's only one way to do it proceed. But there is also a lot of other situations where you can do it this way and you can do it this way. So what do I mean by this? Basically put it this way. Let's say I'm building out a user's profile page. I got version A of the profile page and I got version B. Let's say within the user's profile page here, we have the user's image profile or like the user's image, like the profile image, their email and what plan they're on. That's fine. Sounds good. Same situation here. What is the version of this situation where there is bad code and good code? To help you conceptualize this better, I'm just gonna give you bump ups profile information so both can see it, right? Oh, it's there. Bad code in this context is that it works, but every single time we go to this web page, it references a backend database in order to fill in the variables, e.g. the image variable, the email variable, the plan variable. That means that every single time, if you have a thousand users that go to this page, you're doing 3,000 reads. Reads in this context means how often we are accessing data in the database. This costs money. Therefore, a version of good code that gives the same output would be saving this in the local storage of the actual browser of the underlying user. When I say local storage, that means like the actual browser on the local, the desktop, like their laptop, stores the data in the Chrome browser or the Safari browser, et cetera. Therefore, when I go to this page, it's not referencing the database in the back end. Alternatively, it's referencing data found within the Chrome browser, Safari browser, Firefox, whatever, and that's gonna save you on reads, therefore saving you money at scale. Now, obviously, if something changes here, or whatever happens, you're gonna have an on snapshot listener, you're gonna have the ability to reference the database again, like there's a bunch of other stuff in that context, but that's good code. Therefore, yes, you can build out a full-blown application, but is it good code or bad code? Now, there is a ton more I can say about this, and I'll leave you with one more that I made a video on recently that shows you good structuring but structuring of the actual application. 
Structuring, I'm going to use as an ubiquitous term here that references the way you actually write the code in the sense of naming variables, in the sense of naming files, in the sense of actually structuring the application when it renders in the app.js, like everything like that is very important. And the problem is that when you build out full stack applications, if you start on a bad foot in the future, when you have to rip up your structuring, whether that's your backend database or whether that's your front end and the way you structured your files there, it takes time. It's possible. Obviously, you'll learn and it'll continue and you'll proceed. But starting on a good foot, which I'll reference in that video right there, is always a good idea. Okay, okay. That's the coding. Let's get into other stuff. Situation number two, API. This encompasses a lot of different things. Now, at the end of the day, long term, when you build out a software, you want to have a standalone software where essentially if you have access to no external API, when I say API in this context, I'm referencing the ability to access functions or flows or data in external applications. For example, you're familiar with Zapier, that's kind of their shtick. E.g., I'm on Zapier, I'm accessing Instagram's API to publish a photo externally from a third-party source rather than on Instagram itself. API is gonna be used in an ubiquitous term in this context as this means any type of external third-party use. Just for reference, let me just show you an example of this. Type in Google Cloud APIs, and you're gonna get a whole list of a bunch of APIs you can access in software to do different things. For example here, most software applications provide APIs, some don't. If I type in Google Calendar API, I can access through my software different events through the API. Why am I bringing this up? Why does this matter? Because of the fact in a production level environment, you will only get afforded API at certain limits. Now, let me give you a very specific example. A lot of times when you are accessing an API through a third party source, they will have a thing called quotas, which means that you can only reference that endpoint so many times until you're capped out. Or alternatively, you're just banned. Therefore, when developing software applications, you need to have competency of basically the ground rules for whatever API you're accessing. A very specific example of this for me personally is YouTube's API. This is gatekeeped. When I say gatekeeped, I mean gatekeeped. In order for you to get access to higher quotas, and when I say quota in this context, let's, for example, say for me to post a comment through API on YouTube, that costs 50 quota, and you're going to give a certain amount afforded to you through an application when you access it in your little Google Cloud profile. Therefore, what you need to understand is that to access higher limits, there is an entire review process. Now, some APIs don't have this. You can access it unlimited, you're good to go. But some APIs do have this, and it's a very, very strict process where you have to abide by certain guidelines, TOS, privacy policy. So we'll a little, make a little branch here. We'll put L for legal. In addition, we'll make another branch here. We'll put Q for quota. This is big. Why is this big? Because of the fact that obviously in your early stages of application development, this is not going to be as pertinent because you're not going to have as many users. But at scale, this becomes a very serious issue as you want to make sure that your quota is good, but you're also abiding by their terms of service. Because at any point, these third parties have the ability to click you, ban you, can't access it. So just as a side note, and we'll keep going here, it's always a good idea when building an application not to rely on external APIs. Be standalone. Also, as a larger side note here, this entire video is under the perception you're doing this with a small team and you're bootstrapping it. There is implications outside of this if you're doing it differently, which I'll try to find the video, but I'll reference it right there that shows you the implications of hiring a team or alternatively using no code tools to build out a software. Like there is a ton of implications here. So let's go to step three. Step three, which is probably a really big one for a lot of people and it's gonna hit home is marketing. This gotta be the biggest, this has gotta be the one that sends it home for a lot of people that this isn't just a walk in the park. If you build out a really cool software application, fantastic, post. But reality wise is that now you gotta market it. A lot of times this is kind of a money suck. Therefore, I'm gonna give you two quick tips on this. First off, whatever software you plan on developing, I want you to have like two main ways of viewing it. The first way is like as a major learning experience, like you're learning how to build out a full stack application. Why that's important, is that if you ever need to pivot or build out one in the future, you have that skill set now. So we'll put, we'll put L again for learning. Second one on that point is build out a software you understand and actually need to use. So we'll put U. What I mean by this is that make it a pain point that you experience personally. It's going to kill a lot of birds with a lot of stones. First one's going to kill is that since you need it, you know there is some relevant demographic that would need it as well. My example is bumpups.com. This is for content creators and part of my day, I do content, like what you're seeing right now. So I created something that was very specific to my pain point. This is important as it kind of undercuts a lot of the marketing issues you'll have in the future because you'll know exactly what kind of pain points to address. 
And the last one here is we'll put C. Build something cool. Don't build another Notion app. Don't build another calendar app. Don't build an appointment app. Like, build something cool. I think regardless of however your software company ends up in the long term, this is an amazing experience in the sense of you learn a ton, a very powerful skill, but build something cool. You're going to spend months, years towards building a software. Make it fun. Like, make it actually cool. And the reason I say this is right now we are in a point, an inflection point in history that our ability to access artificial intelligence through API and third-party providers has only been able to do within the last year and a half. Oh, Corbin. You know, we could have accessed GBT2 like way back, dude. Like that's a wrong. St- I'm talking about very comprehensive models and what they can do now at a very cost effective rate. Stop playing with me. So this is good. That means that cool ideas and new ideas haven't been done yet because we're only a year and a half in. Let's keep going here. I mean, this just goes without saying legal. Now, this is a little different from what I'm used to in the past. I used to run a product based business that was a vape company, which is a high risk product. So when it came to that legal work, I was a whole different shabam. This one's a little simpler, but still has implications. Now, obviously, you probably already heard about the EU and everything implied with that, with the GDPR and et cetera, et cetera. But as a bigger thing here, you just want to keep in mind a couple of things here. The first thing you want to keep in mind is that legally, when it comes to your code, in order to sell your company, if you ever choose to do so in the future, you're going to have to copyright it. Big disclaimer there. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Don't take it. What do I know? When I say copyright in this context, we'll put another C here. Also for this, I'm talking about the USA. I don't know how this works in other countries. Why? Because I'm from the USA. The way we copyright code is going to be as a literary work. Now you may be like, Corbin, why, why is it a literary work? This is not a book. That's because the ter- like coding is pretty new when it comes to history. So I guess they kind of grouped it in with literary works is what it is. But you want to copyright it as a literary work as this gives you the ability so that if you ever sell the asset, transfer the asset, there's actually like a piece of legal documentation that shows the asset. Now, when it comes to other types of legal documentation, such as best ways to structure a software company, best areas to start a software company, I could make a whole separate video on that. We could keep going down the list here, but what I'm realizing is that this video could get really long, so I don't wanna make it too long here. I guess I'll leave you with this. Check out that video right there. I go full-blown, in-depth, what it means and what's happening right now when it comes to coding with AI and what that means for the market. As a quick synopsis, quick little like TLDR. Essentially, we're in a window. Within the next one to five years, more likely one to three now, there is an opportunity here when it comes to creating software that was never there before. The issue is when we get to the point where you could genuinely build out a full stack application with one prompt, like actually one prompt, this market is going to be very saturated and very hard to get into. I don't want to leave on a sad note here, but put it this way. Right now, when it comes to AI and the reason you clicked on this video, when it comes to cursor AI, is that you're in a very advantageous position. What you can do now is expedite code output and expedite software development. E.g., one developer can work probably three to four X faster than what we've seen in the past. So we're in the build fast, put out phase. But trust me, when we get out of that phase and it isn't build fast, put out phase, it's like one prompt application out phase, kaput. There'll be other opportunities in the market in other areas, but I'm just saying in this specific area and you found yourself on this specific video, go 100%. So much of an advantage that people born 20 years from now that look back at coding are going to be like, what the heck? I wasn't given that opportunity in this window we're in now to build out a software application that makes you millions and you can kind of proceed in that manner. Keep it simple. I wasn't born at the right age when the internet first came out and I wasn't able to build those first websites in the early 2000s and make my money that way. I just wasn't alive or actually I was alive, but I wasn't at the right age yet. Same idea here. Windows of opportunity. Ours is right now. Take advantage of it because if you don't, then I guess it is what it is. Make sure you leave a like. It's completely free and I'll see you in the next video. These videos are based off everything you've done with YouTube. Are they good or they bad? I might leave one of the cursor videos right there. Check it out. Start learning how to code with AI. That's my face. And I'll see you in the next video.